Hello, uh, this is Ismail Badran again, your instructor for Physical Chemistry for Life Sciences. And welcome to this e-learning uh, experience. And I hope everyone will be safe at this time. Now, uh, we are starting chapter four, which is chemical equilibria. And this is for the, again, for the Physical Chemistry for Life Sciences course, Chem 239. So uh, in this course, we will talk about the chemical equilibrium and its relationship with the delta G, which is the thermodynamic definition. We also gonna talk about the applications of equilibrium, which is basically uh, the pH and the pOH and uh, the logically principles and a lot of that nice stuff. Before we start this chapter, actually I encourage you to watch this video on YouTube about chemical reactions and chemical equilibria. So what I'd like to do is to pause this video for some time, go to YouTube, watch the video, and then come back. Okay, so after you watch the video on YouTube, now I think you have a, a better understanding of what equilibrium is. So for most chemical reactions, we draw one arrow, so that's what our experience is for the last uh, time. Now we are experiencing a new types of reactions where actually the reaction is going back, back and forth. So let's take an example of ammonia formation from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. So if you're actually mixing N2 plus H2, which are already in the atmosphere, you're expecting some ammonia to form. Um, but the problem is once ammonia for is forming, ammonia is going to decompose back again to N2 and H2. So this is a kind of a forward and reverse reaction at the same time. Um, so Matter of the fact is, uh, most chemical reactions are, under, are actually in, in equilibrium, and this is going to be a problem for us when we go to the industry because you, you are, you're starting to make, uh, you're starting to plan to form some ammonia from N2 and H2, but reacting with one, putting one mole of N2 and three moles of H2 won't give you actually two moles of ammonia under practical conditions. It will give you much, much less because of the equilibrium. So if you look at the graph to the left here, if we are starting with a nitrogen and hydrogen at time zero, there will be no ammonia, of course, the concentration of ammonia will be zero. But as time goes, the concentrations of NH2 and NH2 gases will decrease and the concentration of ammonia will increase. Concentration of, concentrations of the two reactants won't go to zero as expected. They will remain at some concentration time. And also the ammonia will remain constant at some time represented by the dashed line here. This is where we define equilibrium as. Equilibrium is when at the point when all of these concentrations are constant. I need everybody not to understand equilibrium to be that we're having equal amounts of reactants and products. That's not what equilibrium means. Equilibrium means we have a constant concentrations of every species. Doesn't mean that we have equal amounts of products and reactants. We might have a situation where we have more products than reactants or vice versa, but doesn't mean that we have equal amounts of both. In the next chapter, when we study kinetics, we're gonna talk about also the forward rate and the, react and the reverse rate, and equilibrium is defined as where the forward rate is equal actually to the reverse rate. And we're gonna come to this into when we study the chapter five, chapter six, which is the chemical kinetics. So chemical equilibrium is state where the concentrations of all reactants and products remain constant with time. It might favor either products or reactants. The problem with equilibrium is that we cannot actually uh, vi visualize equilibrium on, on the lab. You might have a solution or a chemical reaction under equilibrium, and you cannot tell if it's, if it's equilibrium or not. So this equilibrium reactions are actually sometimes difficult to, to, to study. What factors determine the equilibrium position of a reaction? There are the initial concentrations, relative energies of reactants and products, as well as the relative degree of organization of reactants and products. Now let us move to the relationship between chemical equilibrium and thermodynamics. If we start with a hypothetical equation, AA plus BB goes to CC plus DD, and they are in equilibrium, so you have reactants and products. We define, remember, the delta G for the reaction is delta G for the products minus the reactants. Recall that the molar Gibbs free energy is named the chemical potential mu. So if you replace the, the Gibbs free energy by mu, you will find out that the delta G is actually is equal to the, to the summation of the mu's for the products 
minus force minus dose for reactants. Because in equilibrium, we have an equal chemical potential for the total products and reactants, then uh, the sum will be zero, and this is what we define equilibrium as. Equilibrium is where the, the G for the reaction is equal to zero. So if you look to the graph to the right, you have a point. Um, let's start with a spontaneous reaction, let's say. So as the reaction starts, you have delta G is, is negative. That means it's a spontaneous reaction. So the reaction will proceed to form products. And as the uh, reaction proceeds, delta G decreases until you get a point where delta G is zero. You have an equilibrium. To the right side, if you push this reaction forward too much, delta G might be uh, bigger than zero. That means it's non-spontaneous. And therefore, the reaction will proceed backward to form reactants. So the equilibrium is in the middle point here, and it's defined as delta G is equal to zero. Um, recall that the, the, uh, the definition of uh, the chemical potential is mu J equals mu J naught plus R T ln alpha, alpha J, where the difference between mu and mu naught is the, that mu is, is the chemical potential for the species and mu naught is the standard chemical potential. This is how you calculate chemical potential from the standard one by adding the term RT and alpha. Alpha is called the activity. And we're gonna talk more about the activity in this chapter and its definitions. Now the activity of the, uh, of the, uh, the activity of the reaction, actually, it's defined of, as the activity of the products divided by the activity of the reactants. If you plug this into this equation, we can define the reaction quotient Q, large capital Q, as equal to the activities of the products to the, to the powers of their coefficients, divided by the activities of the reactants to the power of their coefficients. And if you plug this into the equation 2, you will find you will uh, come over to this uh, beautiful equation, which relates the delta G with Q. So delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT than Q. So the reaction quotient is uh, an important uh, aspect of this chapter, and it's defined as, again, the activities of products divide, divided by activities of reactants. Now, what is the activity? Activities is defined as follows. If you have a solid, pure solid, let's say pure gold or pure lithium, whatever, at one atmospheric uh, pressure, one bar, sorry, one bar, that's a new definition, this is equal to one. One what? That's one, that's no units. So no activity for the units, okay? No units for the activity. Same thing for liquid. If you have pure liquid, let's say pure water, then the pure liquid water at one bar is equal one. The activity is equal one. And you need to differentiate between water liquid and water aqueous. Water liquid means water, water pure water with nothing. Water aqueous means there is something with the water and that's what we call uh, water. Uh, this is, there's a solute that makes the water aqueous. For a gas, for a pure gas, it's one bar. And the activity in that case is equal P over P star or P naught, where P naught is one atmosphere. And for a solute, for, a, for, for solutions or a solute that is dropped in a solvent, the activity of it is equal J, which is the concentration divided by C star, C naught. So in order to uh, explain this, uh, allow me to here to just go and open uh, my whiteboard. So if you have a solution with a concentration, let's say, equals uh, one molar. So let's say I have a solution, uh, A, that has a concentration, molarity, it's equal to two Mole, molar, or two more, two more, two more. We say two more per liter, right? Same thing. So the molarity has a units. Now in our book, the molarity is defined as J, which is the which is concentration. This is the concentration. The activity in this case, it's equal to J divided by C naught, which is equal to molar divided by one mole. That's what C naught means, molar. This equals to 2. So activity has no units. We divide the molarity, whatever it is, by one molar, and we get the same number without. This is how we, the, the way we drop units out of this. For a gas, let's imagine a gas, 
and the pressure of gas is 15 atmosphere or 15 bars let's say so the activity of the gas is equal to that 15 bar divided by one bar which is uh, p star or p naught that will give you 15 so again the, fifth, the activity in this case has no units okay now because of this fact if you look at the reaction quotient which is a q and um, this applies to the k the capital k the equilibrium constant that we're going to talk about because q is defined in terms of activities and activities are unitless then q is unitless the action quotient has no units as well as the equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant K has no units because of this fact. This example asks us to write the equation, the action quotient. So uh, the action quotient is Q for the esterification reactions uh, uh, of uh, acetic acid. All four components are present in the reaction mixture as liquids. The mixture is not an aqueous solution. So that makes it easy. That means everything here is liquid. Then we define, in this case, uh, Q is equal to the activities of the products divided by the activities of reactants. Now everything, all the coefficients here are 1, therefore this is easy to do. So it's the activity of the uh, ethyl acetate, CH3, COO, C2H5 multiplied by the activity of water because it's liquid and uh, divided by the activities of reactants, it's the activity of the acetic acid multiplied by the activity of the other one, which is the ethanol uh, C2. H5O H. So that's uh, the uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So uh, this is the, 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 the action quotient. If he, the question asks about the K, the equilibrium constant, this is the equilibrium constant. It would be the same thing. You just copy this, and it would be the same answer. Now let us move to the equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant is defined as the same definition as definition as Q. It's the same thing, activities of products divided by activities at equilibrium. So if you go back, if you go back to this slide here, where we show the relationship between the extent of reaction delta G, at this point here at the middle, when delta G is equal to zero, you have equilibrium. And that means Q is actually the same as K. So in this case, Q is K. But anywhere else in this graph, uh, beyond this point, to the right or the left, if you move to the right of this middle point, or to the left, anywhere else in this place, you can define your Q, which is not equal to K. So in any other area here, uh, in this graph, you can uh, you define Q. You say Q is equal to this divided by that. But at this point, at the middle point here, where you have equilibrium, then you say that Q is actually equal to K. Now recall that at equilibrium, we have that the G is equal to zero for the reaction. And if you plug this into the previous equation, equation number two, then you will find that, that, the, that zero is equal to the delta G naught plus RT than K, and you arrange this equation, and you will bring up, this will bring us to delta G naught is equal minus RT than K. This is a beautiful equation. It's a marriage between the thermodynamics, the delta G naught, and the equilibrium world, which is K. From this, you can calculate delta G. From K, you can calculate delta G, and from delta G, you can actually calculate K. So it has an, a very important experimental uh, application. The other thing about this equation, it's the negative sign. Uh, the next uh, negative sign tells us that when delta G is positive, you have a negative 10 to the right, and therefore the link K will uh, be negative, and you will have a small number of K. So for uh, for endogenic reaction or non-spontaneous reactions, you will have a smaller number of K, less than one. If delta G is negative, if it's a spontaneous reaction, then the minus delta G, the negative sign will cancel out with another negative sign. And you will expect ln K to be a, a big number, and therefore K itself will be a, a, a big va value, like larger than one. And, there were, and, and therefore, uh, we are uh, actually uh, beyond equilibrium. And I'll explain this in, in a few seconds. 
this these graphs shows you the relationship between Q and K. As I mentioned, the reaction quotient is equal to K at equilibrium. So if K and Q are equal, then we are at equilibrium. If we are having a scenario where Q is smaller than K, then in this case, we have not reached the equilibrium, K, uh, uh, the equilibrium situation. This is like where you have um, the reaction is just starting, okay? And the Q has a value, but it's less than K, then the reaction will proceed to form products and it will continue to equilibrium. If you have a situation where Q is bigger than K, that means we are actually pushing the reaction too much to the right, forming too much products, and now the reaction needs to adjust itself by forming some reactants going backward to reach the equilibrium. So this is the relationship between the reaction quotient Q and K. Now, let us move to uh, solving this problem uh, relating to equilibrium. The following equilibrium concentrations were observed for the Haber process. The Haber process is the one that is forming ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen at the beginning of the chapter for the synthesis of ammonia at 127 degrees Celsius. You have given uh, different concentrations of uh, ammonia and uh, the N2 and H2. And the question is the following equilibrium concentrations. So uh, we are under equilibrium because the question says equilibrium concentrations. So these we are under equilibrium. If the question says, says the following concentrations, then we don't know if we are at equilibrium or not. Maybe we can find Q out of these numbers and compare it with a given K and then we solve the question. In this question, um, it's asked how to calculate the value of K at the same temperature. And I calculate the value of K at different for the other two equations. Let's solve A and then we move to uh, the other two parts. So here I will switch to my uh, whiteboard and I'm just going to record these numbers quickly. So the reaction we're talking about here is that N2 uh, plus H2 is going to form ammonia. And to balance this equation, we multiply this by 2 and this by 3. And uh, K for this one is equal to the concentration of ammonia. Now, this is, yeah, so this is the concentration of ammonia, or the, actually, the, it's the activity of ammonia, squared, divided by uh, the concentration or activity of N2, because it's the reactants, times H2 power 3. Recall that K is always products divided by the actants. Uh, so for part A of this reaction, of this problem, you just plug in the numbers. So that's a 3.1 times 10 to the minus 2 square divided by N2, which is 8.5, 10 to the minus one power nothing power one and h2 is 3.1 times so 3.1 times 10 to the minus of three uh, that's uh, that's power three if you do the math in the calculator you will find the answer to be uh, 8.4 3.8 times 10 to the power four so 3.8 times 10 to the power four uh, that's at 127 degrees Celsius. I need to mention uh, three things about this answer. First of all, equilibrium constant is unitless. So one can debate why we were not putting the units here, why we don't just put a molar square in the ammonia, for example, uh, and molar here and molar four, and then you will, maybe you have a unit. But remember that we, co we, we defined the equilibrium constant K in terms of activities. And activities have activities have no units, okay? So therefore, this is unitless, no unit. The other thing I want to talk to you about this reaction is that there is no meaning of an equilibrium constant without mentioning the temperature. This equilibrium constant equal this it's equal this value at this temperature. If you change the temperature up or down, the equilibrium constant will change dramatically. So this value is big because the temperature is uh, is relatively high and we're expecting to form ammonia at this temperature. The third thing about the equilibrium constant is that the equilibrium constant 
uh, it has a value for a given equation. So this equilibrium constant is good for this equation. If you multiply this equation by two or divide it by two or you change this equation, then the equilibrium constant is, is, is changed. So equilibrium constant is not a, a standard value. It is a, a value that has its meaning under a given temperature and for a given reaction shape. And because of that, if you go back to the question, now the question says calculate the value of the equilibrium constant at 127 degrees Celsius for the following reactions, which is 2H and H3 gas. It looks like this is the reverse of that action. So let us now see what does that bring us to. So in part B here, We have two ammonia goes to uh, N2 gas plus 3H2 gas. Um, just here, you can put gases for time being. So K for this, of course, this is back and forth. K for this is N2 multiplied by H2 power 3 divided by n2 uh, by the ammonia square now without without going to any calculations you can tell that this is actually let's call this as k prime okay or kb or let's call it k prime okay that's better so this k prime here if you look at it this actually it's equal to 1 over k which is equal 1 divided by that value and you will have a small number and for part for part c of the reaction Remember this for now. For part C, he wants half N2 plus 3 over 2 H2 goes back and forth to ammonia. Let's call this K double prime, okay? For now, you can call it whatever you like. But let's this K double prime now. The new one is the concentration of ammonia divided by the concentration of N two square power half um, times the concentration of H two power uh, three over two. If you think about this actually, and you compare it with the with the K itself, look at K. K is N H three square divided by N two power H two power three. This k here is like, this is what? This is the square root of k, isn't it? It's like you're taking the k, the original k, and you are taking the square root of it. Or it's actually k power half. Square root of k is k power half. So here you have k prime. So here, what, what's, what's happening here? When you are multiplying this equation, you are flipping this equation, right? When you are when you are flipping the original equation, okay, this is equal k minus one. When you are flipping the equation, you are obtaining a k to the power of minus one. And when you are multiplying the original equation by half, you are getting a k multiplied by half. Sorry, the power half. So again, if you are flipping the equation, it's like you are multiplying it by minus one. The k, the new k for that one, it's the it's the original k time power minus one, and it's the same thing for the c part. So what we can deduce from this, we can deduce that k. We can say that if you have, I, I, I hope that you are, and uh, see what I'm going for. If you have a reaction a a plus BB and it's equilibrium with CC plus DD and let's say you are multiplying this by N where whatever N is okay you're just multiplying this by a value N and this so the K N which is the new K should equal to the original K power N so this is here uh, your uh, rule if you're taking an equilibrium reaction and multiplying it with a value, uh, flipping it, multiplying by two, multiplying by multiplying by three, dividing by whatever, then the new equilibrium constant should equal to the original one power that n. And I want you please to practice this at home when you have a chance and uh, solve the questions and the and the book about that.
So I just wrote this down here in the PowerPoint. K double prime is equal to K over N. Now, uh, second, second question says, calculate the equilibrium constant for the reaction N2 plus 3H2 goes to 2H3 at 25 Celsius, giving that that the G is minus 32.9 uh, kilojoule per mole. So, so in this case, switch back to our my backboard here. So that the G is uh, minus 32.9 kilojoule per mole. And uh, we have an equation and calculate the equation. So we need K. Well, that's pretty, pretty straightforward because delta G is equal to minus RT len K. Now, what is T here? T is 25 Celsius. So T is 25 Celsius. It's given in the question. Before you proceed, this is kilojoule per mole. The R has units of 8.314 joule, Kelvin minus 1, mole minus 1. So watch out the joules and kilojoule. That means we have to change this kilojoule into joules. So if you change that, that will be minus 332.9 times 10 to the power 3 joule per mole. I just change it right away. So for minus, don't forget the minus, 8.314 joule kilogram minus 1, mole minus 1 times uh, 298, which is the temperature I changed to Kelvin, lamp K. So in this case, K should equal, sorry, lamp K. So lamp K should equal uh, minus 32.9 times 10 to the power 3 joule 1 minus 1 divided by um, this minus 8.314 uh, joule Kelvin minus 1 more minus 1 times T which is 298 Kelvin. I uh, should be an easier way to do this by the way, but anyway. So the Kelvin goes with the Kelvin, the mole goes with the mole, and the joules go with the oh my god, so this is all cancelling out, even the minus goes with the minus. And uh, you have len k here. Uh, it's equal to uh, 13.28. That means k itself, if you take the until end of that, it's equal e for 13.28. And of course, you get a uh, large number. You get uh, 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 58. Uh, so that's 5.8, sorry, 5.8 times 10 to the power 5. That's a very big, big number, 500,084 something. So again, no units for the K. K is positive, delta G is negative, so it tells you something, okay? So here the, the delta G is spontaneous, okay? Delta G is negative, very spontaneous, the action goes to products, and very large amount of K, okay? A very high value of K, that means that this equilibrium is shifted towards the products. Again, just re-emphasizing the idea that equilibrium does not mean that you have equal concentrations of products and reactants. In this case, you will have a lot, a lot of products, more than reactants, under this equilibrium. Even if it's equilibrium, but you have products more than reactants, because delta G is highly negative and uh, the K is high. Now, what is the significant of the what is the significance of the equilibrium constant? Remember that G is equal minus R T ln K. So, as I said, if you have a, a spontaneous reaction where the G is negative, you have a K much larger. Than, K should be bigger than one. And if you have a large negativity, that means uh, much larger than one. This reaction is thermo. We say this reaction is thermodynamically feasible or thermodynamically favorable. The other way, if you have delta G bigger than zero. Uh, it's endogenic reaction, non-spontaneous. You have a smaller K, maybe 0 0.1 or 0, 0 0.1, whatever. 
and the reaction will in this case is not thermodynamically feasible or not thermodynamically favorable. Um, I, wanna re I want you to recall from the previous chapter um, these four situations where you have a spontaneous reaction at all temperatures and all of those scenarios. I want to focus here on the first scenario where you have delta H is bigger than zero, that means exothermic, and the entropy is positive. This, you remember this is good, right? So this is, this is exothermic and this is also increasing in entropy. That means the delta G will be spontaneous at all reactions and therefore the K will be bigger than the one for all reactions, for all temperatures. The fourth scenario, which is the other extreme, is you have an endothermic reaction that the H is bigger than zero and you have a decrease in, in the entropy of the reaction. The delta S is less than zero. In that case, delta G, this is not spontaneous at any temperature and therefore K will be smaller than zero at, at all temperatures. So you say delta G is bigger, smaller than zero and K is bigger than one at no temperature. That's another way to speak it out. You have also situations in between, which is two and three. I want to leave you to read this at home. Now, let's look at uh, what uh, a nice application of this is that the temperature at which an endothermic reaction becomes spontaneous. So water, for example, melting of water, as you remember, it's uh, endothermic. When ice goes to water, it's an endothermic reaction because it needs energy and it's need, it needs heat to do that. So the, at minus 20 degrees, this, spon this process is not spontaneous because ice won't melt, it, it, it will still as ice. And at 20 degrees Celsius, at plus 20 degrees Celsius, this is just deciding to be spontaneous now. It happens by itself, the ice melts to water. So what is the temperature at which the reaction switches from spontaneous, from non-spontaneous to spontaneous? So you can apply the second law of thermodynamics, which is delta G is equal delta H minus T delta S. At equilibrium, delta G is equal zero, then in that case, delta H is equal minus T delta S. And if you rearrange this equation, you come up with T is equal delta H over delta S. T, of course, is defined in Kelvin. We can use this to find out the temperature at which the reaction switches from non-spontaneous to, to spontaneous and vice versa. Uh, let's take a look at this example. Suppose that the enthalpy change in combining the dissociation of a base pair of, of the, is, the, is the, of the order of 15 kJ per moles. That's delta H. So let's record this down here. So delta H is equal to 15 kJ per mole for a, a given reaction. And the corresponding entropy change is 45. So you have a delta S it's 45 and it's given in units of joule kelvin minus 1 mole minus 1 now watch out watch out for the units okay because the units here do not talk to each other so you have kilojoule and, and joule again at what temperature can you expect a dna chain to denature spontaneously he's talking about the uh, the t the temperature at which this reaction becomes spontaneous well, T is equal to delta H divided by delta S. We just need to change that into joules to make it good with the delta S. So this is 15,000. Okay, I just change it. I just multiply by 1,000 to make a joule per mole minus 1. Uh, joule per mole or joule. Divided by delta S, which is 45 joule. Kelvin minus one, mole minus one. Uh, this cancels that. The joules cancel with the joules, so we're doing good. So it's fifteen thousand divided by forty-five. You'll find the answer to be around three 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 point three three Kelvin. And if you change that to Celsius, you will get around sixty Celsius if you do the math for this. So sixty Celsius is the temperature at which this reaction becomes spontaneous. Uh, I will leave you to do this as homework. It's been solved in the book and you can practice now. Now, uh, it's good to speak about the standard reaction Gibbs for energy. 
as we defined delta H for the reaction in the previous chapter, which is delta H is equal sigma um, delta H for the products minus reactants, this is the same thing here. Delta G reaction is actually equal to the summation of the individual D, the uh, Gibbs free energy formations for the products minus the summation of the uh, individual uh, Gibbs free energy of of reactants. I don't want to repeat that because it has been explained in the previous chapters. We have also elements in their standard states to have uh, delta G of formation equals zero. So for example, uh, O2 gas, N2 gas, uh, all the elements in their standard states, uh, they have a uh, delta G formation of zero. So you can calculate delta G reaction from the corresponding uh, values of that. So uh, I want to do this uh, as an example. Calculate the standard reaction Gibbs free energy of the oxidation of ammonia to nitric oxide according to the equation uh, 4H4 plus 5O2 gives uh, 4NO gas plus 6H2. So everything in gas is here. So you can proceed and do the math. Um, if you go to the table, let me just write the equation again. So 4NH3 gas, so 4 and H3 gas uh, plus 5O2 gas and in equilibrium with 4NO uh, uh, plus 6H2O. In the tables, you have H2 liquid and H2 gas, so be careful about that. Now, I looked at that, and for ammonia, it's minus 16.45. For oxygen, it's zero, so no gas energy for oxygen. For nitrous oxide, it's 86.54. Kilojou per mole, and everything is in kilojou per mole, and this is minus 22.228, minus 228.57 kilojou per mole. So delta G, in this case, for the reaction, it's equal big bracket for the products minus big bracket for the reactants. Just put, put the numbers here. For the products, you have uh, 4 times 86.55 plus 6 times minus 228.57. Uh, minus, there's minus here, sorry. Minus, you have 4 ammonia times uh, 16.45 uh, plus zero. So please uh, practice this at home. This is very important to plug in the correct values and everything. And you will find the answer to be uh, what is written in the slides here, uh, minus 95.49.42 uh, kilojoule per mole. M many people make mistakes when they plug in this number. So please uh, do that uh, as a practice. Uh, this is a practice here. You can do that at home, please. Uh, look at the tables at the end of the book and find out the Gibbs free energies for these species, and you can calculate the delta G for the action. Double check your answer with this 8.4 uh, kilojoule per mole. So by this, I end up uh, the first part of this chapter, and next time we're going to talk about large principle and its application. Thank you for listening, and have a great day.